feel blessed every single week being led in worship by these people. Can we just put our hands together and thank them for leading us so well? So good. I want to begin our time today by asking you one simple question. What does it look like to have an attractive, successful ministry? Have you ever thought about that? Listen, if you ask that question to a lot of different people, you're going to get a lot of different responses. What an attractive ministry looks like is really all over the map when you start asking people. You know, the other day I was having lunch and I was seated at a restaurant outside of our town, I will add, and I couldn't help but overhear a conversation that was taking place between two ladies at the booth right behind me. There were two ladies having lunch, and as they were talking, one of the ladies asked the other lady a simple question that really caught my ear. She said, tell me again why it is you left your church of all those years, and you joined another church in the same town. And I'll never forget thinking, oh, what is she going to say? And I'm leaning in, right? But the lady responded, and this is what she said. I promise this is true. She said, you know, at my new church... The Sunday school teachers provide breakfast for us. And my old church just didn't take care of me like my new church does. And I know that sounds funny, and I know you're thinking, there's no way that's really true. But believe it or not, there are experts, church growth experts, who will tell you, if you want your church to grow, you better provide donuts. (laughs) And you better make people happy. And you better keep people entertained, and you better focus on all those things. There are all kinds of man-made formulas when it comes to building an attractive ministry or building an uh, uh, effective church. Experts will tell you, you better have moving lights, and you better have a fog machine going at all times. They'll tell you, you better have a worship leader that can wear skinny jeans and has a lot of hair product. (laughs) They'll tell you, you better have a pastor that's funny and entertaining and can keep the attention of the people. They'll tell pastors, avoid messages that you preach and people feel convicted of their sin. Make sure you're preaching fluffy messages that are uplifting and motivational in nature because when you want your people leaving, you want them leaving feeling good about themselves. For far too long, the church has completely missed it on what it looks like to have an attractive, successful, God-honoring ministry and what it's supposed to look like. While God uses great music and he will use great preaching and he'll use great family ministries and programs and child care and events that attract people to the church, we have to understand that none of those things are ever going to replace the role or the person of the Holy Spirit in God's church. Amen. 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 I'm glad y'all are awake today. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. As we open up to Acts chapter 13, we're going to see just that. You got these two guys on this journey. Their names are Paul and Barnabas, and they're gonna show us a completely different formula for success when it comes to having an attractive, successful, effective ministry. Beginning in verse 16, we see Paul. He's preaching a sermon. He's preaching this sermon in a synagogue at a place called Pisidian Antioch. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you've seen this map. I wanna show you where we are in the journey so far. We began over here, we made our way to the island of Cyprus, we ended last week at this place called Paphos, I don't know if I'm saying that right, just hang with me, and then now we're, we've taken this red line all the way up here to this place called Pisidian Antioch, and that's where we're going to be camping out at the beginning of this message. Paul's preaching a sermon to Jewish people in the crowd, however, there are some Gentiles that are there as well. And as he's preaching in this synagogue, we're going to see the result of the Spirit's work through Paul's sermon as we dive into verse 43. It says, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. I want you to notice right off the bat that these Jews didn't just say yes to Jesus and convert to Christianity right off the bat, but they were interested in what they were saying. Because it said that they were listening and they were following Paul and Barnabas and they were, they were wondering and asking questions about what this gospel really was. And when you start to unpack the story, you've got Paul explaining it, but he's saying, hey, come back on the next Sabbath day and I'm going to explain in even further detail, even greater detail, what the grace of God is all about. And then you skip forward and you see that a lot of people came back to hear more about God's grace. In fact, when you read God's word, it says on that next Sabbath day, a lot of people showed up to church. 
It says in verse 44, the following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Wrap your mind around this whole story. You ready? He's preaching in the, in the synagogue on one day. The next week, it says the entire town showed up. I want us to take note of that. That's a really big deal. See, the first time Paul preached, it says specifically he preached in a synagogue. And that's important because in that day, most synagogues had standing capacity of about 200 people. I mean, if you're packing them in there for Easter Sunday, you got 200 people like sardines doing this in the synagogue. And so now something happened between that Sabbath and this Sabbath because now the Bible says that nearly the entire town gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Some scholars believe that Luke was speaking in hyperbole when he said the entire town gathered. And the reason they believe that he was being hyperbolic is because they know that a synagogue is only so big. And you can only fit 200 people in an ancient synagogue. Therefore, he had to be speaking in hyperbole. But what we know from historical accounts is that this particular time in this particular city called Pisidian Antioch, there was an, a Roman theater that had a seating capacity of 15,000 people. 15,000 people. Well, we don't know the exact population of Pisidian Antioch in this particular day in history, but what we do know from Roman culture is that they would build these theaters to seat or occupy the entire city population. So we may not know the exact population, but we know that there was a venue in this city that could accommodate this biblical account where he said nearly the entire town showed up to hear Paul preach the word of God to the people. And so here's the first thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes today. You ready? I'm going to kind of give you an outline of this entire passage that we're going to be unpacking today. Four different out points of the outline so that you can remember what God's word tells us. The first thing is this. When Paul was preaching in that event, in that setting with all of those people, the Bible says that the Jews saw the crowds and they were jealous. The Jewish people saw the crowds and they were jealous. Verse 45 says, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. So you gotta remember, these Jewish leaders had been playing this religious game for a long time. They'd been ruling the roost. They were the big man in, in town. And now they're looking around and they see these huge crowds and they had most likely never seen crowds like that in their entire life. They had never experienced that kind of energy, that kind of excitement. They had never seen people responding the way in church like they saw them responding in that particular day. And the Bible says when they saw what was happening in front of their eyes, they became extremely jealous. And instead of suppressing their jealousy or even repenting from their jealousy, the Bible says they threatened with a power shift and they began to publicly heckle the people, the disciples, as they're preaching the gospel. Or perhaps they weren't publicly heckling these people. Perhaps they were just walking around in the crowd whispering lies in the ears of all of those who were listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ that day. Either way, the Bible says their hearts were full of jealousy and their jealousy led them to heap abuse on the disciples as they were preaching the gospel in that day. Man, when I read this passage of scripture, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the fact that jealousy is a nasty thing. I mean, it's nasty. We live in a day where jealousy is a real thing. It's a real problem. We don't like to talk about it. But it's more real today, I believe, than any other time in my lifetime simply because of one thing, social media. We live today in a comparison culture and we're surrounded with people that post their highlight reel on social media all day long. I'm guilty of it too. All of us are. We don't wake up in the morning with our hair all jacked up and take a selfie and be like, this is real, y'all. We don't do that. No, we're posting pictures of our highlight reel. And because of that, we scroll through our highlight reel, everybody else's highlight reel, and we say, why doesn't my family look like that? Why don't I drive that kind of car? Why don't I live in that kind of house? Why are their kids so obedient and well-behaved? Why, why are my kids so jacked up? Why is my relationship with my wife not like this? Why did I get one dozen roses today and she got two dozen roses today? And we're always looking at everybody's highlight reel. And because of that, the devil is sowing seed of discord in our heart. And now we've got the comparison culture causing jealousy in our heart. And you know what the Bible says? That ain't good. And it's not from God. Look at what it says in James 3. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. 
Such wisdom does not come down from above, but check this out. It is earthly, it is unspiritual, and it's demonic. You know what the Bible just said? If you've got jealousy in your heart that didn't come from God, it is a seed from the devil and it is a demonic presence in your life. We see that firsthand in the lives and in the responses of the Jewish leaders of that day. But not only does the Bible tell us that these Jewish leaders were jealous of the crowds, the second thing we're gonna see is that the Jews rejected Christ and as a result of them rejecting Christ, they were bypassed by God. Check this out. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. And he's quoting scripture here. He said, I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He's saying, you missed it. And I love how Paul and Barnabas directly and boldly address the hecklers in the crowd. They don't shy away from the lies. No, the Bible says that they lean into it. And they boldly address the lies that are right in front of their face. Read verse 46 again. Paul and Barnabas boldly replied. They boldly, it could have just said they replied to the hecklers in the crowd, but it doesn't. It says they boldly replied. When I read that this week, I asked this question. Jordan, are you responding to the world boldly or like a coward? Are you going to be bold when you stand on the foundation of God's word? Or are you just going to be like, ah, it's okay, right? What does boldness look like? I love how John Bloom put it. He said, boldness is not a personality trait. Boldness is acting by the power of the Holy Spirit on an urgent conviction in the face of some threat. And that's exactly what we experience here. That's exactly what these men did. They acted in the power of the Holy Spirit while facing the threat of persecution. And they looked these Jewish leaders, religious leaders in the eye, and they boldly told them, God told us to bring the gospel to you first, but you rejected it. We did what God wanted us to do, but you rejected it. You rejected the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. You rejected the fact that Jesus came to save us, to give us power, to give us hope for the future, to give us eternity. You rejected the fact that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you're not. And because you rejected Jesus and didn't go all in with Jesus, now we're taking the gospel to the Gentiles because that's exactly what God commanded us to do. Listen, there's a great lesson for us as the church here today. Do you see it? I mean, you think about it. God's desire was to use the Jews. He's like, man, I want to use you. I want to bless you. I want revival to come through you. I want you to be the one, the main conduit for reaching the Gentiles and bringing hope to the entire world. But the Bible says because the Jews were unusable and they rejected Jesus, God couldn't use them and bless them in the way that he initially wanted to bless them and use them. He had to accomplish his will and accomplish his mission through somebody else instead. You know what that tells me? As a person who prays for revival every single day, I believe that God's gonna bring revival to America, y'all. I believe it's gonna happen in our lifetime. I believe we're gonna see the next great awakening before our heart stops beating. I believe that, I pray for it every single day. But here's the thing, if I'm unwilling to be a conduit for the gospel, if I'm unwilling to be obedient when obedience is hard, if I'm unwilling to go for it and to live out the Great Commission in my own right and in my own way following the lead of Christ, then you know what? God's not gonna use me to bring revival. He's gonna bring somebody else. And maybe I'm just being selfish, but I want God to use me. I want God to use our church. But I understand that revival's not gonna go to America until God starts revival in my own heart. You don't wanna miss it? Man, then ask God to bless you. Ask God to start the revival in you because when we experience revival, the world can experience the revival that's in us. And that's exactly what's happening here. God said, okay, Jews, y'all aren't available to be used. You don't wanna be obedient? Check it out. I'm sending it to the Gentiles, which brings us to number three. The Bible says the Gentiles believed. And as a result of them believing, the word of God spread. Read verse 48. It says, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced. And honored the word of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So it says the Gentiles heard the good news. As a result, they rejoiced. And it says they honored the word of God. And then it says, and all who had been appointed for eternal life believed. 
Now, I know some of us read that and it kind of messes up our mind, but I do want to point out, don't let that phrase shake you up today. A person's theological system, it shouldn't be threatened or affirmed by this one statement. Because the literal rendering of that verse communicates this, that the Gentiles who responded positively to the gospel message were appointed to eternal life. For me, that statement in the Bible is just a great reminder that the work of the gospel is initiated by the Spirit of God. And check this out. Because the Spirit saved the Gentiles, because he did a work in their heart, verse 49 goes on to say, the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. Isn't that awesome? You know, when you read the Bible and you see salvation happen, there's something that typically follows salvation. You know what that is? It's persecution. You see God save somebody, and next thing you're gonna see is them being persecuted because of the salvation that they've experienced. And the same thing happens in this story. That's the fourth thing I want you to see, that persecution and opposition led to a supernatural response. The fourth part of this message. Verse 50 says, but the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. Now you gotta remember that the Jewish leaders are jealous, right? They're heckling Paul, they're heckling Barnabas. They're whispering lies in the ears of everybody that's listening to the gospel all over town. And now the Bible says they're recruiting influential people to speak on their behalf and to stir up persecution among all those who are listening to the gospel. When it says these prominent God-fearing women, it's talking about a specific group of ladies. It's talking about an upper-class woman who had matriarchal influence over the citizens of the city. When it talks about the leading men of the city, it's not talking about the dads or, or the soldiers, it's talking about the government officials. So the Jewish leaders had finally seen enough and they decided to intentionally recruit influential people to rise up in order to strategically eliminate Paul and Barnabas from their city. But what they were really doing was this, they were strategically eliminating the gospel message of Jesus Christ from their reality. And how did Paul and Barnabas respond? Read verse 51. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. They're shaking dust off their feet. Apparently the persecution that rose up with these influential people finally did its toll. And now Paul and Barnabas knew it was gonna be impossible for them to stay. So the Bible says they shook the dust off their feet at these people. You're like, what in the world does that mean? You ever shaken the dust of, of your feet at somebody? We should bring this back. I think this would be a good thing for us to bring back. It's it's a symbolic gesture that really was made famous by the Jewish religious leaders of the day. And, And when they found themselves in an unreligious place, a place that they felt was beneath them or or tainted or unholy, as they would exit these places, they would literally shake the dust off their feet before making their exit. And in doing that, they were stating that they didn't, want the, they didn't even want the dust of these profane people to be on the soles of their sandal. I mean, it was like, like oh yeah, I'm out. Get out of here, I'm out, I'm out. I mean, that's, that would be a common thing that you would see with these strict Judaizers. And so now Paul and Barnabas are shaking their, the dust off their feet at these people. And so they've kind of taken this action that was made popular by the Jewish leaders and they're flipping it on them, communicating that they were actually the profane ones. And they were profane based off of the one single fact that they were rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. So they're saying, man, we want nothing to do with what you believe. And the Bible says they left Pisidian Antioch And this says they made their way all the way to Iconium. I want you to see where that's at at the map. Remember, we were just here at Pisidian Antioch. Now we're gonna follow this line 90 miles southeast to this place called Iconium. And that's where we pick up in verse 52 where it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. That's a supernatural response if you ask me. They were filled with joy and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, why is that supernatural? Let me tell you. Because they had just experienced severe persecution. 
They had just experienced what it feels like to be run out of town, literally, running for their lives out of town with people that hate their guts. And the Bible says, as they are leaving town, headed to this place called Iconium, their hearts were filled with anger. Nope, malice. Nope, hatred. Nope, they were filled with joy. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you why this is so amazing to me. Because that response in their heart, it does not happen outside of a real relationship with God. It can't happen. It can't. You go to Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10. It says, do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You say, how in the world did these people have joy after being run out of town, running for their lives? Listen, it's because they knew that they had been faithful. They had been persecuted. They had been rejected. They'd been run out of town. And yet they knew in their heart of hearts that they had been faithful to preach the word of God to the people at Antioch. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it'll accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Amen. You know why they had joy in their heart? It's because they understood that God's word will always accomplish God's purpose. And I have been faithful to preach God's word when preaching God's word is the hardest, craziest thing that I could do. As I worked through this passage of scripture this week, I believe the Lord gave me three questions that I think we, we need to really consider and unpack today. The first question, if you're taking notes, that I really think we should consider is this. What truth are we rejecting that we should be embracing? What truth out there are we currently rejecting that God is saying, hey, it's time to start embracing this truth? It's real easy for us to read this passage of scripture and to put ourselves in the camp of the disciples. But the truth is, many of us, if we were being brutally honest before the Lord, would need to put ourselves in the leader's camp, the Jewish leader's camp instead. Time and time again, the religious leaders of the Jews were presenting Jesus as the Messiah. They were presenting Jesus as the hope for the world. And they were presenting him as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And yet, because of the hardened hearts of the Jewish leaders, because of their spiritual pride, their eyes were blinded to the truth that was right in front of their eyes. They didn't embrace the truth. I mean, you just read it. They rejected the truth. So before we point our fingers at the Jewish leaders, I think it's wise to ask ourselves the question, what truth are we rejecting that we should be embracing? In John chapter three, verse 21, it says, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accompanied or accomplished by God. Listen, focus on the first part of that. Did you hear what it just said? It says, when we live in the truth, we live in the light. It's a good way to figure out if you're living in the truth today. God, am I living in the truth? Well, that's what it says. When we live in the truth, we live in the light. It's all exposed. In other words, when we live in the truth of God's word, we no longer live in darkness. And so as we consider our own lives today, I think it's appropriate to ask, God, is there any area of my life where I'm living in darkness? Is there any area of my life where I'm, I'm hiding sin and I'm, I'm living in a way that is pleasing to the devil and not pleasing to you? Because the truth is, if, if we're living in the darkness, that ought to be an indicator to us that we are living and rejecting a truth that we should be embracing. We're rejecting something that God wants us to embrace. So you have to ask the question, where am I living right now? Am I living in the light or am I living in the darkness? The second question I believe we need to ask is, how do we respond to the opposition in our path? How do we respond when we're walking down the road and all is good and all of a sudden, boom, there's an obstacle in our path? As I studied the scripture this week, God showed me something. He showed me that one thing that made the early church's ministry so successful, so attractive to unbelievers is because it's all a result of how they responded to the unbelievers and how they responded to the persecution that they were enduring. I mean, when you read Acts chapter 13, verse 52, after hearing about all the persecution they had endured, it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. And I read that and I'm like, how? How in the world did you experience joy 
as you're running for your life? How do you experience joy in the midst of a difficult season where things aren't going your way? How do you experience joy when that's the last thing that most people are gonna experience? And you know what the Bible says? They, they were filled with joy because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever looked up one day and you find yourself in a valley and you're like, how in the world did I get here? And I'm talking to Christians right now. If you know Jesus, you walk with Jesus, you love Jesus, you show up at church and you give and you're faithful and you're doing what you're called to do and, and you believe that you are living a God-honoring life and you are doing everything in your power to love him well and to share him with others and you're being faithful to the bitter end and yet you still find yourself in a pit. Have you ever been there? And you're like, how did I get here? God, did you fall asleep? Are you not paying attention? What happened to my marriage? What happened to my kids? Why is my life a wreck? Why is this my reality right now? Why is my marriage falling apart? Why can't I pay my bills? Why can't I find a job? Why can't I find someone to love me? Have you ever been there as a child of God and you're saying, God, why? You know what the Bible says? Even then, he's good. Even then. And it also tells me that if you know Jesus, that you can choose joy in your life. You say, man, I don't wanna choose joy. Nobody's gonna make you. I'm saying when it's hard to choose joy, you still have the ability to choose joy and that he is still good. He is good all the time. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your joy isn't contingent on your circumstances. And you're saying, man, but my circumstances are so bad. I know they are. And yet you can still choose joy in the midst of a difficult season. Is it gonna be tough? Absolutely. Would some call it impossible? Absolutely. And yet Jesus said, because I am good in the darkness and I, I can bring you into the light even when you're surrounded by nothing but darkness. Listen, if you know Jesus today, you can choose joy. We serve a God that specializes in taking sadness and turning it into singing. Psalm chapter 30, verse 11 says, you turn my lament into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with gladness. And I'm looking at some people today that know what that feels like. When God starts to bring joy back to your heart, when it doesn't make any sense, it's what makes us different. When you have the presence of God and the source of joy inside of who you are, he can bring you joy when the world says joy is unreachable and unobtainable. Yes. Amen. And I, for one, am thankful for that. Amen. But as I read this, I'm just reminded that how we respond while facing opposition in our path is going to determine a lot about our future steps and our future, future journey ahead. The third question I wrote down here was just, what does an attractive ministry look like? Because all of us wanna be a part of a church that is used by God and effective and attractive, right? The West is full of all kinds of churches, all kinds of events that, that specialize in attracting people to draw a crowd. And we do that to build a bridge to the gospel, a bridge to people that otherwise will never hear the gospel. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. In fact, I would encourage most churches to, to ramp it up a little bit and to become a more aggressive and more intentional to reach out to the community in which they find themselves. But hear me when I say this, the success of a ministry isn't solely defined by the size of the crowd. Man, I know some great churches that are used of God and being a blessing to their community that don't have thousands of people. So never assume that a large crowd implies the favor of God, right? The world is really good at drawing a crowd. I don't think anybody would call Disney World a successful ministry. So a large crowd doesn't necessarily imply the favor of God. But on the other hand, never assume that a large crowd isn't appreciated by God. I just believe when Paul and Barnabas presented the gospel to nearly the entire city in Antioch, you better believe that God was glorified in that scene. Yeah. The early church ministry was attractive and it was attractive for several reasons. Let me tell you why. They were attractive because they were full of the Holy Spirit. 
They were attractive because they preached the word of God boldly. They were attractive because they were aware of the cultural context in which they lived. They were attractive because they didn't compromise, but instead they preached the truth in love. Those are the things that attracted people to the early church. It wasn't because they had a coffee bar. It wasn't because they had good marketing. It wasn't because they had really good childcare or donuts in Sunday school. Not that any of those things are bad. I love coffee and I really love donuts. People were attracted to the early church because they had something else. You know what that was? It was the presence of Almighty God. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit. Man, when I read that this week, I asked one simple question. And my question is, can the same thing be said about us? Are we a church where you can experience God in a real way? Are we a church that when you enter into worship with your church family, you can sense and experience the presence of God in a real way? Can you feel the Holy Spirit working? Can you see the life change happening? Is this a church that is pursuing Jesus more than everything else? Because when we're not, we miss it. Whenever we stop doing that, we might as well close the doors. When we forget that, We're going to tend to embrace unattractive qualities about the church that we have no business pursuing. When I started thinking about unattractive qualities of the church, man, I thought of several things, but I narrowed it down to three because three is like the magic number for preachers. But here's what I wrote down. Three unattractive qualities in the church. The first one I said is this, when we are focused on being slick instead of being sanctified. Sometimes churches get so focused on the production that we tend to forget about our purpose. And we get so busy trying to please people that we forget that we're only supposed to be pleasing God. Leonard Ravenhill put it this way. He said, if we displease God, does it matter whom we please? And on the flip side of that, if we please him, does it matter whom we displease? God didn't call us to please people. We're not here to cater to personal preferences. God didn't call us to be slick. He called us to be sanctified. Man, when you start unpacking the word of God in 1 Peter chapter one, it says, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct for it is written, be holy because I am holy. It just reminds me that God wants you and I to pursue holiness more than everything else. It's not about us, it's about him. Sometimes maybe it's just me. I, I just wonder well, how, how in the world we as Christians can come to worship and we can worship our God with a frown on our face. I don't get it, personally. I mean, if we truly know Jesus, right? If, if we understand what God has done on our behalf, if we've been saved and and sanctified and redeemed and restored, if we've been made new, if we've been born again, if we've understood that, that God loved us so much, he sent his one and only son to die in our place so that we could have a relationship with God that otherwise cannot be experienced with him or through him. Understand, how in the world can we be unmoved in worship? Why don't we worship with reckless abandon? Why do we care so much about what other people think and what other people say? Why don't we prioritize reading the word of God if we truly believe that this word is from God and it's alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword? Why don't we spend time talking to him and listening to him? When's the last time we just sat in silence and said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Why don't we make disciples? Why don't we share the gospel? Why is that not even a priority on our Monday, on our Tuesday, on our Wednesday? Why don't we give generously if we really believe that everything that God's entrusted to us belongs to him and we are simply a steward should honor him in the way that we give? Why don't we give faithfully? Why don't we live faithfully? Why don't we serve the Lord intentionally? I believe the answer to all those questions can be summarized with one simple statement. You ready for it? It's because we are not personally pursuing holiness above everything else. If we are personally pursuing holiness about everything else, it fixes all that stuff. Even us as parents, any parents in the room, raise your hand if you're a parent. God help them. But even us as parents, man, we bring our kids to church once a week, right? And we, 
And we use discipline throughout the week in order to kind of modify their behavior because ultimately we feel the pressure as parents to raise good kids. But the truth is, God never told us to raise good kids. God told us to make disciples. Big difference. And here's the thing, we're not gonna make disciples if we're just focused on raising good kids. We're gonna make disciples when we begin pursuing holiness and modeling to our kids what it looks like to prioritize our relationship with the Lord above everything else and pursue holiness every single day as if that really is the goal of our life. Listen, if we're gonna get this right, it begins with us personally pursuing Jesus. If we're gonna get this right, it begins with us personally pursuing holiness and us personally being sanctified in our every single day walk with the Lord. So that's number one. Unattractive quality of the church is focused on being slick instead of being sanctified. Where it's all about the presentation and what everybody else sees and has nothing to do with what the Lord sees when he looks at our heart. Second thing I put is an unattractive quality of the church is when we rely on our own wisdom, our own power, our own abilities, instead of relying on God's wisdom, God's power, and God's abilities. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. But man, if we're being brutally honest before God today, so many of us would have to admit to him that we rely on our own understanding a lot. Right? Am I the only one? Anybody else say amen to that, right? There's so many times where we don't even give God a second thought. As you walk through the day, walk through the week, I'm making decisions for me. I've got the crown of lordship on my head. I'm the boss. I'm the one dictating what we do next. And we don't even consult with the God of the universe that we say is the Lord of our life. Listen, if the church is gonna get this right, it has to be this. It has to be more of God, less of me. That verse jacked me up this week, y'all. It's John 3.30. John 3.30 is a six-word verse that I've read a thousand times. But this week I read it different. It's not just he must increase, I must decrease, as if it's a suggestion. I emphasize this word, he must increase. I must decrease, right? It completely reads completely different. It's not a suggestion in God's word to help you get better He's saying, if you're going to be maximized for the kingdom of God and the glory of God, and if you're going to do what I called you to do, you must decrease and I must increase. That's what God's saying to us right there. And so I don't care what the problem is. There's your solution. My marriage is in turmoil. What do I do? You got to, you got to let him, you got to decrease and he's got to increase. But I'm working on faith. I'm trying to figure out how to walk by faith. How do I do that? He must increase, you must decrease. But I live in fear and I'm worried and I'm blah, 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 blah. What do I do next? Check it out. He must increase, you must decrease. When he goes up and you go down, God's able to go to a whole different place with you in your life. And so that's the the deal. An unattractive quality of the church is when we rely on us and we don't even think about him. His power is way greater than your power. And he can take you to destinations that you cannot arrive if you continue to go on your own strength, wisdom, and power. The third unattractive quality of the church, and then I'm done, I promise, is when we conform to the culture through compromise instead of transforming the culture through Christ. Today is not the day for the church to be a coward. Today is the day when the church has to rise up. And we have to keep our feet on the firm foundation of the word of God. You know what it says in Romans 12 too? Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't know if you guys have watched the news in the last year, but we are living in a day where the world hates this. We're living in a day where religious liberty is a topic of conversation on every single channel. There are people in Washington, D.C. trying to figure out how we can tax the church and how we can shut down the church and how we can muzzle the church. But I'm here just to tell you that that right there cannot and will not happen. It can't. Today is the day where the church is gonna have to make a decision. 
We're gonna have to make a decision. And we're gonna decide, are we going to be faithful and move forward even if things get tough? Or are we going to conform to the culture around us? I'm just telling you right now, this is just me personally. They will have to throw me in jail before that happens. Y'all come visit, write letters. I don't even care. I'm serious. I will straight up go to jail before I will allow us to conform to the culture and shut down when somebody says shut down. You know why I say that? It's not to... Hey, don't clap. I'm not doing that for applause. Here's why I'm doing it. I, I'm doing it because I know that when the church conforms to the culture, when the church conforms to the age of this world, the church is displeasing God. And we can't afford to displease God. We can't afford to displease God. So I say that to say now is the time when the church must stand firm. Now is the, ch- the church's opportunity to put our feet on the foundation of God's word and say, hey, we're not going to back down. Hey, we're going to continue to tell the truth in love. It's time to show the world that our only hope is in Jesus. He's not one of our hopes. He's our only hope. He's our savior. He's our joy. He's our hope. He's our salvation. He is our eternity. He is our everything. And the world has nothing to offer. And so if we forget that, then we're going to be moving forward without him without his favor, without his blessing. We as a church have to move forward in faith and we gotta trust him. And man, I'm on on somebody's TV screen today and you don't attend our church, you attend a smaller church and you're saying, man, we can't do what y'all do. Listen to me, you don't have to have thousands of people. You don't have to have glitz or glamor. You don't have to have large budgets or buildings or staff members. In order to have a successful ministry, all you really need is Jesus today. It's more of him, it's less of us. But I'm not talking about the church as a whole. I'm talking about the church right here. If we want to experience revival, stop thinking about revival in America and start thinking about revival in here. Because when a revival happens in here, it can happen out there. And when revival happens out there, it can happen out there. Revival's got to start somewhere, but until we as children of God come to God and say, God, I want to be used. I don't want to be bypassed. Let me be the Gentiles. I don't want to be the Jews in the story, man. I want to be used. I don't want to miss this opportunity. I want to be a conduit for the gospel. I want to be a part of seeing the great commission fulfilled in our day. I truly believe that we're going to experience revival in this day. I, I believe that before our lifetime is up, Many of us are going to get to see the next great awakening in America. But guess what? It's not going to start in America. It's got to start somewhere. And I want it to start here. Maybe it's me being selfish, guys. But what if that revival started right here? What if it happened in Cleveland, Tennessee? What if it started in Bradley County? What if the revival that changed America started in your heart? Can God do it? But it starts with us being usable and willing, and obedient. Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes? Let's not miss this moment. Some of you know that revival can't start in your heart because you truly don't know God. You've been playing a religious game with him. You know what it's like to go to church and hear stories, but there's never been a moment in your life where you've surrendered all to Jesus and said, Jesus, I don't wanna be the boss of my life. I can't accomplish salvation by myself. I need you. So let me just say, if if today God is speaking to your heart saying, hey, no more religious games, go all in with me. If right now you have a huge question mark when you think about where you're gonna spend eternity and you're thinking to yourself, I would love to solidify this right now and know that I know that I know that I'm a child of God for the rest of my life on planet earth. I mean, I just invite you to say yes to Jesus. Is there anybody here today that says, man, I've, I've often wondered if I know him, but today I want to go all in with Jesus. Is there anybody that says, you're talking to me today? Just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. Praise God. Thank you. Anybody else? Say, man, I need to go all in with Jesus. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Thank you. See, others of us in this room, we know Christ. We've been saved. We've been changed. But many of us would say, I'm not being maximized. Maybe you're more like the Jewish people. Let's say, I haven't trusted Jesus fully and I need to do that. I don't wanna miss this opportunity of being used by God for God. I wanna be used by him, but I know it starts with obedience and my willingness to lay down my stuff and saying, God, I want you to increase and I wanna decrease. 
There's some of us that need to say that to, to the Lord today. God, you need to increase. I need to decrease. I need to make you big. I need to make me small. I need to get out of the way so you can work through my life. If that's you today, believer, be honest with the Lord. Would you just raise your hand? Put it up and then down. Say, man, you're talking to me. I need God to increase, me to decrease. My hand's up. Hello. Praise God. Lord, you see our hands, but more than that, you see our hearts and you know. You know what our hearts are telling you right now. So God, for the person who needs to go all in with you and be saved and really and truly become a child of the King and not just a religious person who found themselves in this part of America, the belt buckle of the Bible belt, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation and that they would enter into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and that their life would be changed from the inside out as a child of the King. And for those of us who know you, God, give us the obedience and the desire to move forward by faith. God, I pray that as you look at our life, that it'll be, it'll be an experience that puts a smile on your face. And if we're not there right now, God, move us. Move us to a place of action, a, a place of movement where we are pursuing you and pursuing holiness. And we're doing it in a way that honors you, God. God, thank you for our church. And I pray for revival. I pray that you would do something here that is unexplainable. That you would continue to save and you would continue to move us on mission and that you would continue to expand our territory so we can make a great impact in the world around us. But God, let that revival start in me. Let it start in us. Let it start in our hearts individually so that we can be knitted together for such a time as this. We love you. We trust you. We want to be on this journey with you, trusting your power every second, single step of the way. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, would you stand? We're going to have a song of invitation. And during this song, I want to invite you to move. If you raise your hand and said, man, you are call, you're talking to me. I need to get my life on track. I need to give my life to Christ. I invite you to come forward as a testimony that says I am unashamed of what Jesus is speaking to me right now. Some of you need to join the church. Some of you have prayer needs or concerns and you just want to come to this altar. The altar is open, stays open. So I invite you to come. Put the stake in the ground and say, God, from this point forward, I will never be the same. And I am committing or recommitting or going all in with you beginning at this point in my life. But I just encourage you, if God's calling you to move, if he's calling you to action, the worst thing you can do is have the devil convince you to stay put. So move forward, trust the Lord. And in doing so, know that you honor him with your obedience. Eric, lead us as we sing together. Church, let's make this our prayer. We we'll make Jesus the center of our life. What an amazing message by Pastor Jordan. And what a great reminder that we are not the ones that need to be famous. Jesus is the one who we can continue to make famous. And the best way to do that is as Pastor just said, is to ask him into your heart. Let him be the Lord and Savior of your life. And then everywhere you go, people will not see you, they'll see Jesus. And the way to do that is right now to text the word SAVED to 74784 so that we can contact you and get in touch with you and help you learn to make Jesus famous. And we want you to stay connected. There's a lot of things going on here at First Cleveland. And the best way to do that is go to firstbaptistcleveland.com. And there you'll find groups. You'll find what we're doing on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings, and all sorts of amazing things. So go to firstbaptistcleveland.com and we'll see you next week.